I try really to understand what made the book so good. So I, I read them over and over and over. Right. But after a while, and that was maybe when I was beginning to write good, I had to forget about them. You know, you can't have too many demons. You know, I have to even forget about my old father in heaven. <laughs> and I have to forget about Stieg Larsson and just be a bit crazy and wild. Just write. Right. So even though he was the brilliant guy who invented these characters, they had to feel like mine, and, and after a while they actually did. Good evening, my name is Yvonne Hunter. I'm the head of programming for the Appel Salon here at the Toronto Public Library. Tonight, eight years after the Millennium Trilogy, it is a pleasure to welcome from Sweden, just off a plane, as I mentioned, from Washington, David Lagerkrantz, bringing back a character who transcends genre. In conversation with crime writer and publishing reporter Sarah Weinman, when Larson died suddenly in 2004, none of his three best-selling novels had yet seen print, and they did become that elusive phenomenon, and he left behind a great monument and a masterpiece. It's no exaggeration to say that as an invention, Salander is in the same ballpark as Thomas Harris's Hannibal Lecter. This is another comment from Lee Child. David Lagerkrantz was selected by the Larson estate and his publisher in Sweden to satisfy our hunger for more Salander. He worked as crime reporter for Expression until 1993, covering some of the biggest crime stories in Sweden. He has written several novels and worked with Swedish football star Zlatan Ibram Ibrahimovic. I knew I was going to struggle with that. <laughs> Which broke sales records in Sweden and throughout Europe. Our host, Sarah Weinman, writes for the New York Times, the National Post, The Guardian, the Wall Street Journal, Hazlitt, and she is a publishing insider as the news reporter for Publishers Marketplace. She's also the editor of a new anthology on women crime writers, and you can find her online as the crime lady. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage Sarah Weinman and David Lagerkrantz. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I just wanted to know for the benefit of the audience, have you been to Toronto before? This is your first visit as a, as a writer. No, it's actually my first visit. I was a hockey fan when I was, you know, I, I, I don't know if you remember Burry Salming, but it was, uh, you do, you do, that, that was my first hero. And I actually met him just a couple of days ago and he looked still tough, you know, with scars all over. <laughs> so, wow. So, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. I still okay. am. <laughs> so let's start with a question that I know yeah. that you've probably re received many, many times because I know that you've yeah. had many, many interviews yeah, since, yes, yes, yes. since the announcement back in, oh gosh, the end of 2013 yeah. that you were going to write the yes, continuation yes, yes. of the series. So just describe what that call was like. What were you doing? Where were you? And when I got the question, well, it's, it's a bit of a long story, but I, I, I tried to, to make it a bit short. I, I changed literary agent, and then I was writing this big love story. I've always been dreaming about, you know, write a big love story. But maybe the male character was too much like myself. And is that a problem? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's always a problem, I think, because I'm too neurotic, you know, to, to, to be a really good literary character. And, and my wife, who is very clever, said, I think, David, this is maybe good, but I think you're using writing as therapy. You're complaining too much, and this <laughs> character is too depressive, for God's sake. So he, she had this theory that I'm best when I sort of collude myself with other words. You know, I, I've written about the English mathematician, Alan Turing, and I've written about uh, Slavon Ibrahimovic. And you've written about, I believe, a mountaineer and Everest. Ye yes, you know, all kinds of odd people, uh, odd, brilliant people. And then I said to, to, to my agent, you know, I'm this crazy kind of author that even like assignments, because it's get me going to, to write about it. And, I, and then I sort of saw her face change. Mm -hmm. And then I got strange SMS from, you know, my, uh, the publisher uh, who was reading my old books. 
And then in August, I think, uh, 2013, right? yeah, I was smuggled in the basement because back then I belonged to the competitive <laughs> publishing house. So I couldn't even be seen in the house. Which house was that, just for curiosity? Uh, in, uh, yeah, it was in Riddar, Norsta's publishing house, you know, yeah. Riddar Fjärden. Anyway, and so we sat there, you know, in this dark <laughs> building, and then they asked me, would you, David, consider writing the fourth book in the Millennium series? <laughs> <laughs> and what did time stop? <laughs> yeah. yeah, sort of, sort of. No, at first I thought it was joking. You can't do anything like that. But then I started to feel, you know, after the Ibrahimovic book, who actually was a, a quite of a beautiful thing, I think, I think it's the best, the, mo the best selling book in modern times in Sweden. Right. And it got all these kids from the suburb who had never been close to a library or a bookstore to start reading. And after that, I got so many suggestions of books. But I, I, maybe I was a bit spoiled. So I met all these kind of fancy celebrities. But I was, oh. now, I didn't get to go. But when I hear, heard this, you know, wow. I, I remember, you know, walking home in a state of fever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was absolutely passionate about it. Well, I just want to go back a little bit to yes, what you absolutely. said about t wanting to take on assignments. Why does that appeal to you, or why has that always appealed to you as opposed to coming up with stuff on your own or enterprising? As a journalist, did you prefer yeah. coming up with stuff on your own and then going out and investigating, or did you want editors to tell you what to do? Yeah, I, I like that. I mean, there are brilliant writers, and many go back to their childhood, or their invent universe, invent universe. But something happens to me when something brings something that it may be my opposite. And my, my sister, who is actually an actress, yes. used to used to say that I'm this actor writer. I'm better when I go into, you know, can put a bit of myself in someone else. So, and you know, the Ibrahimovic book sort of changed my, my writing life and, and my life at whole. You know, I was traveling all around, and he was my absolute opposite. You know, sure. I'm this very neurotic, weak intellectual, for God's sake, sitting here shivering in Toronto, and he's this macho guy from the ghetto. But something happened when we smashed together. So, so I think a sign could, could get you going on things that you hadn't thought of otherwise. So also to kind of go back, how familiar were you with the Millennium novels and with Larson? I understand that even though you may have traveled in some similar circles, you didn't know him and you didn't really encounter him. No, I mean, if, if you go back to, to Stig Larson, the sad thing about this, you know, this great uh, uh, novelist and, and, and great moral crusader was that didn't, many people didn't even know that he existed. Because back then, you know, he, the paper he worked for was very small. Right. And the racists in Sweden were just a small group of lunatics. Now we have them in, in parliament, for God's sake. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's so sad. So, but I think he saw what was coming on. And he was also under threads. So he wrote yes. under pseudonym. So even though I was in the business, in the media business, I didn't know that I didn't know who he was. So it wasn't like a six degrees thing where later you found out, oh, I have this friend who knew this friend who knew Steve. Yeah, something like that, something okay. like that. But, and that's, I mean, you, you know, of course you know that he went to uh, another publishing house. Yes. Yes, and they didn't even look at his books. Maybe well, before it was unusual. crazy coming with three books looking like this, you know. But, but that's a sort of a classic mistake, you know, like uh, Decca turned down Beatles or something, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I presume that your publishing experience when you published your first book was a little bit different. You didn't go in with like three no, no, gigantic manuscripts. No, 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 no. I mean, that, that's extraordinary to do a thing like that. I mean, I'm happy, you know, to write two pages. And he, yeah. he wrote three books, <laughs> you know, and, and, and he is, waited he was to right. go for it. I mean, that, 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 uh, it's great, actually, yeah. He was right. He, he had the vision, and it sold, uh, and it's and Oh, now gosh, it's, oh, gosh, yes, yes, yes. And he saw what was coming, yes. So I think by now, if you aren't aware just from reading some of the press coverage, there was a lot of advanced chatter about how you wrote it with the air-gapped computer and having to keep things in secret. And that's interesting, but I'm more interested in a way of how you came up with the story. Yes, yes, because it, it, if you go back to this basement that I was talking about, yes. and they said, will you? 
but they were, I mean, they were quite thorough, so they didn't say, yes, start, David. Start with a stormy night or something, and you find something out. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's ideas. the tricky part with crime fiction, isn't it? We need a story, and we certainly need, when we ha try to fill his, you know, pants, this, who has this great, complex storyline with many threads coming together. So I had to write a synopsis. Yes. And, and going back to walking home in sort of a fever, you know, something starting to, to wake up in my head. And then the next day, or I think it was the next day, I woke up four in the morning and remember a story I did about artist savant. You know what yeah. a savant is? Yeah, you remember the, the Rain Man movie with Dustin Hoffman. And I'd always been crazy about this odd kind of, you know, brilliant person, like Lisbeth, for example. Or like Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing, yes. And I remember after the Dustin Hoffman movie, I asked the leading nebrologist, do we have any savants in Sweden? And he presented me to a couple that had an eight-year-old mm -hmm. boy who was half deaf and he hadn't spoke his first word. But one day he actually passed a traffic light. And the next day, without anyone had teach him how to draw in three-dimensional uh, things, mm -hmm. he drew the traffic light exactly. And I suddenly remember that old story, and I, maybe I thought that he's just kind of a mirror figure to Lisbeth Salander, yeah. who and also has a photographic memory. And then, of course, I thought, what will happen if a character like this, like this witnessed something horrible as a murder? And what will happen if the murderer finds out that he's a savant right. and can p p pay? And who will save him and protect him if not Lisbeth Salander? And that was the start of it, yeah. <laughs> and without giving too much away, I think some of the strongest scenes in the no, book No, no, I will not. No. Is <laughs> maybe I had to. I mean, it's so exciting. So maybe I have to tell you the, who the murderer is. But otherwise, no. you get. <laughs> Shall I? No, maybe not. Maybe not. No. You're the author, you get to decide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. No, but what I was saying is that some of the strongest scenes in the book are with uh, Lisbeth and the boy. Yes. And you really get the sense of she sees in him who she used to be. Yes, yes. And I it's, think as so. you said, with the, with the whole mirror concept. Yes, I and think so. And so. Also, there's understandably a lot to do with hacking and the latest technology. Yes. And of course, it's interesting to bring up because the original Millennium novels were written in the early 2000s, yes, and they really yes. reflect what technology yes, yes, was at the time. Yes. So how did you sort of change or, or bring forward the narrative to reflect today's technology, but also keep Lisbeth kind of, like we don't actually know how old she is. We know what Larson now, says how old she is. Now we have many interesting questions. I don't know what to answer <laughs> first. But Let's start with the, ha the hacking the, the and technology. The hacking thing. I mean, Stig Larsson was such a, I mean, a brilliant author. He saw what was coming in, you know, in the new Sweden with all, you know, the, the racism. And, but he also saw other things. Back in his, his days, the worst hacking attack was done by outlaws, you know, right. young person like Lisbeth Salander. Nowadays, the worst hacking attack is done by states and intelligence like NSA. So I, I, I so quite early on understand that we live in a word now. We had a Snowden thing yes. blowing up, you know, when I was starting to write. So I, I sort of figure out what we live in a word when we need Lisbeth Salander more than ever, actually. And she needs challenges, this girl. So I thought, what about hacking NSA? Wouldn't that be something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's a little bit dangerous. Yeah, and, and if the NSA founds out, finds out that she's actually hacking them, uh, they will probably come after her. Right. And then I had a savant, and then I had NSA, and then I thought of, yeah, I have something. And then bam, 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 I wrote this synopsis in a sort of a fever again. I reread the book and looking for all kinds of threads. You right. Know. And then I waited nervously and got an SMS from my publisher with three words. It was, so damn good. That's not bad. And then I went like Ibrahimovic or Burya Salming back in his days. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and, then, and then I started. Off we went. And then how long did you have to write it? Uh, well, I think I worked for it one and a half year, or more exactly one year and three months, something like that, yes. yes. So, but I worked hard, you know, yeah. yeah. 
I haven't slept since. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and now they're you know, taking you all across, the, all across the world to promote this. Yeah, yeah, but that's another thing. Writing was something else, yes. Sure, but that kind of leads into my next question, which yes. is understandably when, when news of this book was announced, oh. It was not just greeted with great joy by no, fans, of course not. but no, of course not. we have to bring up some of the controversial oh, parts. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. First of all, you can say we didn't know how what will happen. You know, uh, I was the ghostwriter of a, of a soccer player, and I will now continuing and other authors. We thought, I mean, what will the media think about it? And we know that we will send out a, 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 a message about mm -hmm. it. Two o'clock uh, this day, this, uh, I think it was the 17th of December, and then all the papers send out news flashes. And you know, news flashes in Sweden, we do it when we have explosion in the city or something like that. And then the whole media got absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. and, and that was, of course, we had this very tragic thing, I think. We can speak about if you want, yeah. uh, about you know, the rights. But it's, it's something with his book that engaged people so much. He's such a, such a, he is such an icon, and his book is, certainly is as well. So the whole world got absolutely crazy, and I've been living in, in this craziness ever since. So how do you make sure not to be part of the craziness and to just sort of keep your head down and write? Uh, uh, well, I haven't. Uh, I mean, I finished a book, but after that, you know, th that, that's another story. So, so now I'm recovering because now love actually streaming in from the fans, and we get to go great reviews and people actually yes. saying she's back. We have been longing for her. But before the launch, before you know, nobody have have read the book. I was grilled like a politician. Right, it was embargoed. I was a grilled politician. We had Syria. I mean, we had Palestine. We had refugee crisis, and we had Putin. But I was on the top of the news. <laughs> <laughs> they had their priorities. Yeah, they had a priority. Yes. But did did your Swedish publisher explain why they wanted to embargo it? Because I've seen some reports where you were not totally thrilled with that idea that you wanted to sort of talk about it, or uh, it, was that also? I media? mean, I, I think they were afraid. They were, you know, we felt that they really were, you know, the whole world was wanting to read this book. So we were afraid they were going out and put it on Pirate Bay and so. Right. But I, I, I told in an interview, then they were a bit angry. I used to be a reporter. Yes. And you know, I was you know quite, I was quite embarrassed. You know, I met I met reporters, and I couldn't read the book, and they had ten minutes, ten minutes with me. I was just embarrassed. You know, sorry, sorry. So so yeah. It's strange to be under embargo. When yeah, you, yeah. When strange. you're used it to asking the questions. It was very strange, and they and they have to sign all these reporters, all these fancy, clever reporters have to sign this, you know, secrecy documents. I went, and I was a little embarrassed about that. So obviously. Lisbeth is the key character. I mean, even in the copy of my book, and I presume the copies that yes. you're going to see tonight, it says a Lisbeth Salander novel. But I also wanted to ask what it was like to write those other characters, like Blomqvist. You have a lot of fun with some yeah. of the social oh, media oh, stuff gosh. around but, him. But uh, I mean, in, in, in the States, in Canada and England, it's Lisbeth Salander. In Europe, it's more in the Michael Blomqvist and the Lisbeth yes. Salander novel. And I think if you have an extreme character like that, you need other more normal characters to see her through. I mean, Sherlock Holmes certainly needed Dr. Watson. Of we couldn't be inside Sherlock Holmes' head. It would be too strange, I think. So, we, I mean, that's the beauty of his books, that there are so many great characters. He, he writes in his good old Russian storytelling mm -hmm. way, changing perspective. We are in the head of Michael, and we are in the head of, of Lisbeth, and then the villains, and the police detective. So, so I, f I mean, Michael is sort of, uh, Blomqvist is sort of the, the, the guy, I'm not saying that, I, that I'm Michael Blomqvist because I'm, I'm, I'm certainly more neurotic, and, 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 uh, b b but anyway, he's the guy I wanted to be, you know, mm -hmm. he's good and correct, and he has these great values, and when he has a story, he's absolutely passionate about it. So, so it's, you know, I, and, and, yet, and, and then I also loved, you know, writing about media. I've been, the me, been in the media business my whole life. Right. So to see how things have changed and to sort of gently satirize a little bit of it, that must have been Yeah, yeah, that was fun, you. you know, yeah, having my revenge, you know, <laughs> uh, for all the or editors treating me badly. No, but I thought, what, <laughs> what, what would happen to a guy, to a paper like that? 
you know, a paper who dedicated itself to investigating journalists in times when media is bleeding. And I, I thought it was quite of a good idea that he was seen a bit of a dinosaur in the beginning. Right. You know, you know when we, you know, he's not on tweet, uh, on Twitter, Twitter and social media, and so he's. But he's the essentially old an fashion. underdog. Yeah, he's an underdog who. who and, and I think that's important, actually. We have, when we are so quick now, we have to have reporters that are slow in the good sense, who dig. So in the beginning, uh, I mean, he has troubles. So he's seen as, a, you know, some guy from the old, old days. So he needs a revenge. Yeah. And he will maybe get one. I don't know. Yeah. And <laughs> the one thing I will say about the book, too, is in terms of how you structured it, you had to keep, Salander and Blomqvist kind of apart from each yes. other for a while. Yes. And was that something that you knew right away, that's the way I'm going to tell that story? Or did it just become clear as you were putting it together that you had to sort of keep, it, keep them apart? I think, I think it's very interesting, the relation they have. If you have other, you know, classical, we have uh, Superman and Louis Lane. I mean, that's more clear. He's the strong man. That's more the, the traditional. And, and they're sort of in love. But with Lisbeth and Michael, we really don't know what's going on. I mean, for a while in the first book, she fell in love with him. Right. And he's a bit fatherly, of course, and he's a womanizer. Are they, they're, of course, they're attracted to each other, but are they friends or what are they? And they're driven apart. So I think it was really interesting. What is going on between them? So well, I thought it was a good idea that I haven't heard of each other. So in the beginning, we just heard rumors about Lisbeth. I mean, is she going really mad? Is there a new kind of darkness going on in her? Well, I think the line you have, and I'm probably going to paraphrase it, not quite right, but is that Blomqvist at one point thinks that friends aren't really friends if all they're doing is hacking your computer. No, no, no that's right, that's right. No, so no I really just figure, what happened to Lisbeth? I mean, and, and maybe, I think he misses. I mean, she doesn't even hack my computer anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> where which is, is Which she? is a deeply, deeply strange concept if you yeah, start thinking yeah, about yeah. it a little too closely. Yeah. But um, the other thing that I wanted to, to get into is, you know, not only are you presenting yourself, understandably, as the author of this new book, but I think people want to know a little bit more, more about you. Yeah. And I know that so you're... what do you want to know? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your, your background and Stig Larsson's background yeah. are markedly different. And I understand yes, that yes. that has caused some discomfort for you as you were becoming a journalist and becoming known. And I just wondered what sort of challenges that posed throughout your career, and especially taking on the series. Coming uh, well, essentially yeah, from now you're asking, you know, now we're really in a therapy session or something. So, <laughs> so, so now I have to put it shortly. My father is my real demon in my right. life. And, and he is the very highbrow person. Mm -hmm. We didn't speak about bestsellers or uh, crime fiction. And, I mean, well, he, he wrote a biography guy. of Dante and James Joyce and Marcel Proust, you know, and being vulgar, you know, writing this bestseller, you know. And, and of course, I idolize him. You do with a father like this. He was the center of all the intellectual elite in, in, in Sweden. But in one way or another, I understand, I can't go in his footsteps. That would be embarrassing to start to write the same thing. So I sort of had my, my, my rebelling years. That's maybe why I became a crime reporter. Because mm -hmm. in my family, it wasn't fancy becoming a crime reporter. You should write brilliant essay and first have a couple of PhD or something. You know? <laughs> but I went to, to crime reporting. And then, finally, you know, I had the chance to write what I really wanted, you know, a biography of Dante or something. But, you know, the whole crazy journey being out there in the tabloids, writing a crime and being read, actually changed me. Mm -hmm. So I'm still, you know, this very schizophrenic guy. I like being a bestseller. Well, that's good but, to admit. But, but I'm a bit embarrassed about it as well, you know. So I see his demons. So I want to do it both. And hopefully that could be something good, this right. schizophrenic thing, that I want to write quality. I want to have it, you know, from heaven. You know, this is good, David. This is quality. <laughs> so, so hopefully that, you know, it will meet. And, and, I, and, and, and I have some example. I will not compare myself for a second to Dostoevsky. Maybe Stig Larsson could do that, because he, he is that great storytelling. 
But I think Dostoevsky became a really good writer when he lost all he owned in gambling. Mm -hmm. You know, he was addicted to gambling. Yes. And then he had to start to write for the, the magazines and, and had to use cliffhangers. And he had his vision as an artist. So I think when you know, your vision to write quality meets with the demands of the public, something good can happen. And then I, well, I hope that anyway. So just to kind of move on to a slightly different topic. The, was that an answer to your question? It was, what? more or less. Yeah, yeah more or less. It'll, Sorry, it'll you know. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, this book is not just being published in Sweden and garnering huge attention. It's being published all through Scandinavia. and Europe, it's being published 48 in 48 languages, I think it is, for the moment. How it's not publishing in all of them, but it's 48 languages. How so. many are you able to speak or read, and how ah. many translations could you consult? I speak 46 languages. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm happy speaking English, actually. So, so, yeah. And a bit Finland Svenska. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, as this book, because it's being published in multiple translations, yes. how much were you a part of figuring out did this work, or was that more on your publisher's end? I'm just, can you figure talk out what you mean? If the translations were close to what you were writing, like, uh, did it work? Like when you read no, the English I, I, version, I could check the English, but you know the Mongolian version. You know, I was sort of, <laughs> what could I do? Right. What could I do? But but it was good having forty eight translators because they discover embarrassing things. You know, when What's I mix up facts. What's the most embarrassing facts. thing? You no, know, there was something you know that I didn't check. So so that was good. So so thanks for that. <laughs> so one thing because I write a lot about crime fiction. Yeah. I'm particularly interested in what's happening in crime fiction all across the country. And so Stig Larsson sold in a way in Sweden that had really never been seen before, to the best of my knowledge. And I just wondered, first of all, who were you reading before you embarked on this project? And what sort of scene is happening on the crime fiction front stretching all the way back from Cheval and Valo and moving, moving forward. You I mean just, what happened to the Swedish crime yeah. fiction writing? Yes, and also you, who, you, you, who you yourself are reading. Uh, uh, well, that's the, the, also the embarrassing thing. If you go back again to my old father, I was raised in the wrong way. He mm -hmm. didn't put any you know, crime novels in my... You know, the first sort of a fictional work I read was uh, The Godfather of Mario Puso. That's a good one. But that was, all, but that was, all, all, uh, that was just because it was my first sex scene on page 24. So. You and many so, other teenage boys. You know, so when I p picked it up in myself, it sort of fell out like this, you know, <laughs> on page 24. But, but so I was, <laughs> sorry about that. But, but I, <laughs> I was a bit late, actually, to discover crime fiction. And, uh, but when I did, you know, I sometimes like it more than any books. But you can say there are certain crime fiction that is a bit like eating a cake. You know the sure. feeling? Yeah. It's, oh, wow, it's good. And afterwards. And then there is crime fiction who really educate you or get you to see the world in a new way or maybe uh, find injustice in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what the Swedish crime fiction did when it was best. Yes. It sort of put the spotlight on the wounds of society. If you go back, crime fiction was more just entertainment, mm -hmm. just something you had, I mean, just watching some. But going back to Cheval of Bali, we have this moral pathos, and Stig Larsson certainly did, and I think it sort of changed the genre. And after him, we had a lot of good Swedish crime writers. Yes. He was sort of the, the Börje Salming or, or the Björn Borg. You know, after you know, we have a great star, they will follow others. Right. Yes. And by the same token, here in Canada and certainly in the US, there is now this tradition of writers continuing other series by authors. So Robert Ludlum was mentioned. There's yes, yes, the yes. James Bond series. Yes, yes, Bond, of course, yes. And, and so, is that also part of why some people were concerned or found it controversial that you were doing this? Because there's no tradition of this in Sweden? Well, it, the sad thing is, to be, to be really serious, is that they haven't reached a settlement with right. the rights. So, so this has really been the thrill of my life. And I didn't hesitate a second, you know, because I felt passion when I got it. The only thing that really troubles me or shadowed the whole project was that the, the widow, Eva's, his part, yeah. Eva Garbison, was so sad. And, and, uh, and it makes me still sad. So I'm still daydreaming that they will reach a settlement. 
And, and I respect her deeply in everything that she has gone through. And she said, and her friends say, let his authorship rest in peace. Mm -hmm. And I can respect that, but being an author myself, I've not met many authors who want their authorship rest in peace. We want to be read and discuss. And what I now know for certain, it makes me so happy, that a new generation of readers are actually reading and discussing his books again. That because that of your book. For certain, but because of yes, this book. That they're because, going back to the original series. And yes, it's new and we're for also uh, discussing his real life work, which was actually fighting racism and intolerance. So for the legacy of Stig Larsson, I think this is a good thing. And of course, for this character. I mean, Lisbeth Salander is too good. I mean, think if Gordon Doyle's relative said, don't never, never touch Sherlock Holmes. That's wouldn't actually that be, been happening lately. Yeah, but there, wouldn't that be a little sad? There was some sad? legal stuff, yeah, yeah. wouldn't be that a little sad. But isn't that a testament to Larson's talent that he created such an iconic character yes. in Salander that she really almost transcends him? Yes, yes, yes. I think Elizabeth Salander, if he changed, you know, crime fiction, she changed the female heroine in some way. I mean, if you go back a hundreds, uh, hundreds of years, we had this, you know, princess in the castle screaming, waiting for the prince and his white horse mm -hmm. rescuing her. Had a you know, maybe putting down her long red hair or something. Elizabeth Salander is so far from that you can come. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's the girl who the society tried to crush, but she refuses to be a victim. She just got stronger and stronger. And she understand, even when she was just a kid, that society wouldn't do anything about her evil father raping and abusing her mother, that she has to take on it herself and, and, make, and make this revenge or, or, or yes. So I, have so I think, I mean, after Lisbeth Salander, she sort of changed the way we saw, we see female heroines. I think she's such an important character. Or what she's done is she sort of made female heroines seem much more and that we can look at her and she's the sum of so many different influences, yes. but she's so holy herself. Yeah, she's absolutely. It doesn't have this, this tra traditional female, you know, motherly thing. She's something absolutely else. But what I also quite early on understood that I didn't just in, had a great privilege to inherit Lisbeth Salander. I also inherit her mythology. Yes. Like all good superheroes, in a way, she is a superhero, isn't she? Uh, uh, she has a great mythology. I mean, Batman's parents were killed, and he, you know, early on understood that he would revenge and yes. make Gotham City. Superman would sort of send to Earth as a Christ figure. And Lisbeth Salander has this background with the evil father and the lovely mother, and, and you know, and th there is this ground wound when she understands that she has to take revenge yes. herself. And she's so not I understand happy early on that I had to dig in that, and uh, I also discover, of course, that she has. Uh, maybe I shouldn't tell that. That but, might but be a spoiler. You know, yeah, but, but yeah, that would be a spoiler. But she has a sister. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think people who have read the Millennium books would know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you so read much. it from, but I would not say anymore. And, and she's not a good sister, is she? <laughs> well, anyway, forget about that. More I didn't put her in the book, no. <laughs> That's for all of you to find out. In yeah, the yeah, no, no, I didn't. didn't. So that, that and, and she and she, she didn't hack NSA either. I Are was just sure? kidding. No, no. <laughs> so let me ask one more question, then we'll turn it over yes, to the audience, please. which is that it seemed to me, again, without giving things too much away, that you end the book quite similarly to some of the ways that Stig Larsson ended yeah, some of the yeah, earlier well, books, yeah. which means are you writing a, a, a sequel to this? What's your next project? That's the, the most common question that I get all day. Uh, and I used to say it's very tempting now, because now we're getting these great reviews. I'm sitting here and love streaming in from the fans, so it's very tempting. But first of all, I had to see if I will, would survive this launch, because for a while I thought I wouldn't. But it's very tempting now, but I can say, that I won't be Stig Larsson for the rest of my life. I want to be unsecure. I want to do even more scandalous uh, things in the future. So maybe I write a fifth book. We will see about that. You will find out quite, uh, quite 
quite soon, yeah. And lastly, do you think that the girl in the spider's web will bring more attention, hopefully, to your own work? I know that the Turing novel is available in English. Yeah, and I yeah, that yeah. Some of that's what's happened when you have a success. I, I don't want to brag. My father would be embarrassed in mm -hmm. heaven because that's the most. You can't. You shouldn't ever brag. But it's actually uh, the number. To, this is the number one bestseller in all the all over the world. The New York Times bestseller list is yes. big in Germany and Italy and all over the world. So of course they're all agents. I mean, they look at my old books. So I have to, that's, that's kind of tough, you know, read them again and see, shall I really translate this? You know, yeah. How do you think your first agent will feel about all this? Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> I have some books that maybe, you know, could be something. We will see about that. Excellent. Well, I'd like to open the, question, open the crowd to questions. I believe yes. there's a microphone at the center. Hi, David. Hello. Uh, my name is Gan, and uh, uh, congratulations on a, on a fantastic book. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, <clears throat> you know, but when I picked it up, uh, I picked it up on a Saturday morning, finished it at about 11 o'clock on Saturday night. Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> you know, the thing that was going through my mind was when I read this book, I want my heart to tell me that Stieg Larsson wrote the book. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, you, you wanted to feel that. And yeah. I mean, I wasn't looking for literary evidence, but uh, I just wanted to feel that, you know, if he were alive and he wrote the fourth book, would it be this book? Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm uh, very sincere in telling you that it felt like that in every oh, page. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy to hear it. So my question is, uh, did you want to do that specifically, like, did you want to say that I want to write as if Stieg Larsson would have written it were he alive? Did, did you have that? And, and if so, how did you put David Lagerkrantz away? When oh, you, yeah, when yeah, you that's the question. How do you do that? N no, I, I mean, I think we all had the same goal, the family in the publishing house, that when we read this novel, we shall feel at home. Right, in right, the millennium. Right. I couldn't give, I mean, Lisbeth Salander three kids and she leave them, you know, eight <laughs> o'clock to daycare. <laughs> it wouldn't be right to her. Uh, and, and so I, I really try to understand, you know, the way he wrote, you know, this, his storytelling. But in the same way, I had to put something in myself in it right. as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so I, I, I think I tried to write in the same way that he did in his stories, but not in the in, in my prose, you know. I went right. to my to my journalistic, not my most literary prose. But that is very interesting, you know, going into a role as an actor, you put something, you must put something of yourself in it because otherwise you won't do the role good. So so I, I, I think Hopefully, this was a good collusion between us, but, but you know, I, I had his deepest respect, so I tried really to understand what made the book so good. So I, I read them over and over and over, right. but after a while, and that was maybe when I was beginning to write good, I had to forget about it, you know? You can't have too many demons, you know. I have to even forget about my old father in heaven. <laughs> and I have to forget about Stieg Larsson and just be a bit crazy and wild, just right. right. So even though he was the brilliant guy who invented these characters, they had to feel like mine. And, and after a while, they actually did. Oh, they actually did. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Uh, there is just uh, one comment. Uh, I agree with everything except one thing. It was page 26. Oh, David. gosh. <laughs> Have you found something on page 26? I'm embarrassed. And I have 48 translator, and they didn't just see it. Mario Puzo, page 26. Uh, oh, oh, now I see. Now I see your point. No, no but I've heard it's, it's, it's too little sex in it. You know, I've, I've got criticism for that. Stig Larsson had more. Yes, please. Uh, another question. I have to admit, I, I wouldn't know what page it was on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to introduce uh, the competition, sorry, I'm a great fan of Kurt Wallander. Oh, yes. As a cop, a kind of anti-cop. Yeah. Uh, brilliant, intuitive, 
but his personal life is a mess. Yes, it's yes. Disastrous. Yes. It's chaotic. Yes, right. Also problems with his yes, yes, I know all father about that. and his daughter and everything. Yeah. And definitely has a dark side. Yeah. And someone asked me once, who also was familiar with Swedish crime novels, what makes Swedish crime writers so good? Your, yourself included, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and well, is, I, it, is it because of the dark side? Uh, yeah, it could be, because, I mean, when, when we started writing good crime novels, Sweden were a very secure state. We didn't have uh, many murders. We sort of, you know, had to see them or fantasize about them. I think the Swedish noir genre grew up from the good old safe Sweden. But I think, again, that one of the things that makes Swedish crime writing so good is the moral issue that started with Sherba Labala, that we really wanted to tell something about society. We use crime fiction. And I think when you read crime fiction, you want to learn something and maybe even be angry how unjust the word is. And I think uh, Swedish crime writers are very good at that. We have a tradition, especially, of course, after Stig Larsson. And that uh, neo-Nazi theme does appear in, those no in Henning Mankell's novels. Yes, yes, of yeah. course, yes, of yeah. course, yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. But, but Stig Larsson, uh, I uh, heard, was very uh, thorough that uh, Michael Blomqvist wouldn't have drinking problems as Valander. So I had to be careful not to make him drink too much, even if it was very tempting sometimes. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. There's two things. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you. It's only 400 pages long. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and the second... Yeah, yeah. Stig Larsson wrote a, a bit more. Uh, yeah. yeah. And the second thing is I hope when they make the movie, it will be made by Swedes. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> good, yes. I agree, I agree, I agree. Um, David, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you didn't uh, talk about uh, the book too much in it, um, telling us what's going on. I'm, I'm about halfway through. Oh, sorry. Sorry about all but the things. No, no, I no. bought it two weeks ago when it first came out, and I literally did not read it for about a week. I was just, oh, please let it be as good as the first uh, three. Uh, uh, I hope it but does. I just want to let you know that I literally read it on the, uh, we have a gold trade here, and I just cannot put it down the whole time. It just oh. really lives up to that. I'm going to let you know. But I just, my question. But it will get better if you have to. Re <laughs> oh. so, so don't it, worry about it. Yes, yeah. But, but it is great. It, it just is living up to my expectations. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so know. happy. But I just wanted to, you didn't really talk about what sort of preparation did you do in terms of uh, getting yourself to sort of follow you know, like, I'm just, I was just trying to wonder, how would you do that? Uh, Did you have to do that, or you just came up with the idea of the savant and with uh, hacking and this sort of yeah. thing, and you just came up with the yeah, story? Yeah, I just came up, I just woke up, you know, as I told you, and had this idea. But, but I think one of the good thing uh, and the terrifying uh, thing with this uh, book was that I was actually scared to death. I was scared to death when I, you know, especially after the, when we put it on public and understand, you know, how important this book are for so many people. And being scared to death is not a nice thing, but it gets you going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like an adventure in danger, you know. You work harder, or a reporter with a big story two hours before the deadline. So, so that, that was my real prepar preparation, you know being absolutely terrified, not living up to Stig yeah. Larsson. Well, I was scared to death to start reading it, no. but it's, it's, it is okay. so good. Anyway, uh, I just want to you, congratulate you. you for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And it looks like a lady is running up. Oh, gosh. Take it easy. <laughs> There's a glass of wine. Yeah. Oh, oh, I want one, too. Yes. <laughs> Um, firstly, you're you're much younger in the flesh. You look much. Am I young? I I was reading an, an article um, about you, and there was a quote in it that you found it very difficult to to write the Salander character. Um, you gave her too much emotion. Yeah. And you had to step back and. Uh. 
change her? Can you oh, yeah, comment yeah. No, no, I mean, if I was scared of someone, it was Lisbeth Salander. You know, and that's maybe why it, it takes a while when we meet her in the book, because, you know, in, in the beginning I exaggerating her too much. She was this crazy, you know, punk warrior, and then I tried to put a motive. That's what you normally do with your characters, but she didn't really suit in it. So I worked with her to find her code all the time, and then I realized you, she's an action hero. You must find the, the right scenes for her, and when I found them, she's starting to be alive, but gosh, I worked and I had nightmares about her all the time. <laughs> so, and then I had my publisher, and that was great. We were discussing the sort of the boundaries. Would Lisbeth Salander do this? That was really fun, because my publisher was really involved. That, that was fun. Would Lisbeth Salander do? Why not test her to be a little like this? You know, and could she, this, this relation with this young guy, so much can I say, how motherly can Lisbeth Salander be or not? You know, testing the boundaries of Lisbeth Salander. I, I, you know, I, I worked on it day and night, and I thought about her, you know, and, and I, I, have it in, I have her in me. That was, I mean, she was tricky, and she was tricky, she tricky because I think she's one of the most iconic figure in, in modern, you know, pop culture. So, gosh, I worked hard with her. <laughs> Well, it, I haven't read the book, and I'm glad you didn't give too much away. Thank no, you. No, no, sorry. Maybe I did too much, but <laughs> I, talk, I always talk too much. You know, it's one of my problems. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you, David Lagerkrantz, for a you. wonderful Thank evening. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.